going on, man? Charlie in the box. Check it out. Look at what I got in my box. A little bit of footage when Bill Ayers came to Fresno. I need one of you guys, please. Can you guys send this to Glenn Beck? Because I know he'll like this footage. I really don't know how to use a computer that good. That's why you see a lot of video mistakes in my videos. So I, I think that we made colossal mistakes. I think I don't think we should be heroized or valorized, and I've tried never to do that. Um, I consider myself. My students are always astonished when I say this. I'm 65 years old. I still consider myself a work in progress. Or as I say to my students, I have, still have shit to do. And I know you've done everything. No, I have not. And I haven't done half of what I want to do. And actually, the older I get and the closer the cliff comes to me, the more oh. urgent I feel about not sleeping because I have more stuff to do. So if anybody wants to stay up all night, um, call me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so what got me, th the other thing, I, I could go on and on about violence. I mean, one of the people in the film, I think it was Naomi, said, you know, the problem is, it, it, it's, it would be lovely if we could say, and that's why I say to Ellie, I, am, I consider myself repu repulsed by violence, repelled by violence, not personally a violent person, I don't want to be violent. I've also participated in lots and lots and lots of activities, including cutting chains at Fort, uh, ben, uh, what's it called? Benning, Benning, Georgia. I've done that, and that's violent. I've burned my draft car. A lot of people thought that was violent. Mm -hmm. I've burned it many times. And in fact, so many times that it's kind of lore in our family that, you know, I remember once when I was with the kids driving along, and Malik, my middle son, who's now 30, was about four, and he was remembering this little bit of family lore, and he said, Poppy, tell us about the time when you burned your credit card. And I said, whoa, I'm not that radical. You know? I need the credit card, and it's hard to burn. No, you know, I mean, in other words, you know, I've done a lot, and a lot of it, and some of it has been destruction of property. That first arrest I was arrested for, we destroyed draft files, and many people, it was reported in the Ann Arbor News that we were violent because we were committing vandalism. I don't endorse violence, but I do open my eyes enough to notice that we live in a sewer of violence, that we live in a violent society. We push it away. We don't want to believe it. But if you think a trillion dollar military budget a year, more than the rest of the world put together, doesn't distort and pervert our society, you're dreaming. It's a perversion. It's a distortion. It's in our high schools. It's on our media. We are a violent society, and yet, those of us who are middle class, those of us who have jobs and incomes and privileges can anesthetize ourselves and push it to the other side of the gated community just like my mother could ignore global warming because her lawn was always green and her country club swimming pool was always full. But that doesn't mean that global warming wasn't true and it doesn't mean we're not a violent society. So I'm involved in the world of education and when people say, but where would we get the money to do the things you're dreaming of? Come on, people. Connect the dots. Connect the dots. I mean, this is crazy. So the military budget is unimpeachable and untouchable. We just have to accept that. And meanwhile, we're going to fire 30,000. We're going to fire 300,000 teachers in America, including my son Malik, an eight-year teacher in Oakland, California, got a pink slip three weeks ago. Stop it. You know, it's madness, and so I want to connect the dots, and I, and, and I see us living in violence. A little kid dying of pneumonia in Guatemala is a violent death, quietly executed, and we don't have to look at it, and that's a mistake. Yeah. But I've said many, many times, and I've been quoted many times, as saying, we didn't do enough. And that's always interpreted to, to mean we didn't do enough of that stuff. And it's not at all what I meant. So I'm going to clarify it for you. We didn't do enough because we didn't end the war. And that means you didn't do enough also. I didn't do enough. I should have done more. I should have, as Naomi said at the end of the film, we should have been smarter, clearer. And if I have one very serious self-criticism, I, I uh, hinted at it in the beginning. The very serious self-criticism is that the Weather Underground, for a period of time, forgot the important fact that when you act, you must doubt. If you don't doubt, you run the risk of becoming dogmatic and, and, and sectarian, and we were that. We were splitters. We were people who, if you weren't pure, then you weren't one of us, and that's a psychology that I recognize. It's a, but it's not unique to political organizations. It's true, it run rampant in the human condition. 
Uh, have any of you seen The Life of Brian, for example? <laughs> Uh, the Life of Brian is about a reluctant messiah. If you've never seen it, go and put it on your Netflix list. Uh, it's about a reluctant messiah. At one point, he's standing on a rampart, and he says to the masses below, I'm not the messiah. And they say, you're not the messiah. He says, no, you have minds of your own. And they say, we have minds of our own. And, you know, he's, and one guy in the crowd says, it's funny, I don't feel like I have a mind of my own. And everybody says, shut up, you have a mind of your own. In terms of the media then and now, the, there's a very interesting thing that happened at the end of the Vietnam War, which is the Pentagon made, and it's, you can find this written document from the Pentagon. They did an analysis of the media during the war. None of the media, you know, we, people scream about the liberal media. The media that went over to cover Vietnam were not liberal and they weren't particularly anti-war at all. They simply reported what they saw. And if you think war is glorious and lovely and perfect, then you're missing a lot. Um, so the media weren't radicals and they weren't anti-war, but they became anti-war. In fact, to, to tell you how un-anti-war they were, in 1968, or 67, I guess it was, Walter Cronkite did a long, loving interview with Yun Kao Ki, whose favorite guy was Adolf Hitler, and Walter Cronkite called him the George Washington of Vietnam. And the New York Times, in January of 1968, editorialized that there was light at the end of the tunnel, and soon we would be winning. That sounds awfully familiar, you know, and, and it's, a, it's the same old narrative. But the fact is that the Times was a cheerleader for the war, and so was CBS, and so was the entire liberal media. Now today, they pat themselves on the back and say, we brought the war into your homes, and yippee for us. It's, you know, it's pretty actually arrogant of them to take that position when actually, it is true that reporters on the ground who are telling the truth will make you see something awful that you don't want to see because it contradicts the myth of invasion. The myth is we're bringing civilization, we're combating evil. The reality is evil itself. And so the Pentagon wrote a study, made a decision, and the decision was never to allow an American reporter on an American battlefield unencumbered. And that has been true from 75 till today. So those of you who are reporters, if I, if, you know, if I were in that profession, I'd be screaming. I have a right to go where I want to go with the interpreter I want to go with to see what I want to see. But they don't. So they are now embedded. Or as my friend Studs Turkle used to say a couple of years ago, he said, I'm deaf. Did they say the reporters are in bed with the military? <laughs> yes. Um, yes, that's exactly what they said. And, 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 and there is no free reporting from the battlefields since 1975. That's a huge and important change. A lot of other things change too, but that's a huge and important change. I was saying, there are many, many differences between Vietnam and the, and the wars that we're involved in now, and then there's some stark similarities. What are the differences? One of the differences is, in spite of what you said, Vietnam actually had experienced a deep social revolution, a deep social revolution in which peasants actually had come to power in many ways. The whole problem with Cambodia is that we created the Cambodian situation. We're not free of the, it wasn't like, Cambodia was, you know, the Khmer Rouge was the result of the peace movement. We created that situation by invading Cambodia and overthrowing, um, you know, the, the king and so on. And so the, the idea that we're somehow isolated from the consequences of that is not true. Uh, so there wasn't a bloodbath in Vietnam. There was a bloodbath in Cambodia, much of it the result of our intervention. Um, but. The similarity between then and now is whenever you invade another country, whenever a big imperial power invades another country, they always invade with a myth and an enemy. There always has to be a myth, there always has to be an enemy. And so when you hear kids, young people, you know, who are in Iraq, I heard a kid, a, a soldier, being deployed back to the United States on NPR, and he said, you know, it's really, um, we didn't accomplish everything we wanted to, but you know, when we got here, there was nothing, and we built something. And you think, nothing in the cradle of civilization? That's the imperial view. The imperial view is there's nothing there until we put it there. And that's insane, and it drives all kinds of criminal behavior. So in England, they had the white man's burden, and they were gonna do away with all the cannibal 
whole civilization. The French had the civilizing mission, and underneath it, they were going to get rubber plantations. And we are going to now, back then, we were going to save the world from communism. Now we're going to save the world from terrorism and install democracy. It's a myth. It's a fool's errand. And we will pay for it and pay for it and pay for it, not just with our own lives, with the lives of other people and with the wealth of the nation. So we have to oppose.